And now, great. So we have uh, we have uh, our speaker. So how is it in Amsterdam? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, actually quite pleasant, but unlike uh, unlike Australia, it's uh, the end of the summer over here. So we got 30 degree weather the last couple of days. So that's quite exceptional. Uh, I think it's uh, the hottest month uh, on record in, in really? like 100 years. So. Yeah, but, so it's, it's uh, pretty good. Pretty uh, okay. actually, actually, I've uh, the, for anyone uh, anyone attending the uh, the presentation. There's actually quakas in my presentation, so I will uh, oh. I'll, I'll, I'll take that away from uh, uh, from the attendees. They don't have to Google it; they just have to watch the presentation. It's all in there. <laughs> okay, I was like like really because uh, I didn't uh, hear about uh, this island. Well, if you if you told me, oh, maybe Fraser Island, I would know. So now I I really checked and. I did okay again. I didn't know that quokas are in Australia, so I know. Uh, yeah, I knew uh, other animals, <laughs> Australian animals. Okay, uh, I think that this is a lot of entertainment <laughs> from me when we were waiting uh, for you, and because a previous speaker finished earlier. So now uh, I introduce you already. So once again, Yab Brasser. Uh, for those who just join us, he is presenting from Amsterdam and he is developer advocate at Rubrik. And Jan will be presenting about discovering API version differences with ease. Welcome, Jan. Goede morgen. Thank you. That's, uh, that, that's very proper Dutch. <laughs> Thank you. And now I'm leaving you um, with the audience. Can you please uh, share your screen? Yep. Let me know when you can see it. Yes. Perfect. Oh, Quokka. <laughs> exactly. Sli slightly blurry, but it's uh, it's definitely uh, definitely a Quokka. <laughs> Thank you so much, and see you in 25 minutes. Yes. Thank you. So hello and uh, and welcome uh, welcome everyone. Um, I'll try to keep it uh, I'll try to keep it interactive. So if there's uh, if there's any questions during the session, feel free to. I'm I'm not sure if uh, the attendees can unmute, but otherwise, uh, Paulina can uh, perhaps uh, forward uh, forward your question directly. A little bit about myself before uh, before I get started. So my name is Ja Brasser. Um, as Polina told, uh, told you, I'm based in Amsterdam, so it's early in the morning here. I'm a developer advocate, and I have a background in uh, system engineering and scripting. So you, you know what kind of uh, what, what kind of questions you can uh, you can ask me. And obviously, I'm with my head in the clouds, and cloud automation is my jam. And I'm also interested in security and doing it in a in a responsible way. So with that out of the way. The agenda for today, um, it's pretty simple. Uh, I'll first dive into our API, what our API does, uh, to give a bit of a background uh, in uh, where our challenges uh, come from. Then we'll go over uh, over the tooling, and at the end, I'll leave uh, five to 10 minutes for uh, for some Q&A, so you can, uh, you can actually ask, uh, ask your questions. So, uh, if there's no questions so far, I uh, I assume not. I'll uh, dive right into it. So our API uh, has a couple of purposes. So our product is uh, a cloud data management uh, product. So what we can do with our API, we can initiate backups, restores, uh, we can manage our data, we can execute and build uh, DR plans. Uh, we have anomaly detection, so if there's ransomware going on, uh, what is happening in your environment, what should you do to fix it? We have uh, that kind of tooling. And if you're building out uh, test and development uh, scenarios, for example, you you have a system at a, cer at a certain point in time that you want to test something against, we can also uh, automate that to, uh, to our API. So that's all fine and well, but what does our API actually look like? So 
Uh, our API architecture is we have our uh, guest API which runs on our uh, which runs on our uh, cluster. So it's uh, built on an open API spec. So obviously the first thing we'll do when we're connecting is we'll uh, we'll authenticate against the against the cluster. Um, we can either do that using a username password uh, or an API token. So. Uh, uh, using our API, um, we can either use our UI. So our UI is uh, is consuming our own APIs. So our, our entire platform is completely uh, completely API based, and we also have abstraction layers on top of that. So obviously, if you're a developer or if you just like playing directly with APIs, you can just do your curl requests, or you can use you can use Postman to. Uh, to build out your own uh, your own logic, uh, but we've taken it a step further and we uh, we developed uh, a number of tool, tools on top of it. So you can think of uh, different SDKs. We have plugin, we have automation tools, and they all uh, consume the the same API. Um, our product also consumes third party APIs, but. Uh, that's uh, that's out of the scope for uh, for this session because we'll be looking at how we can mon uh, what I've done to to monitor our changes in our API. And the one other part that I would like to highlight is the fact that uh, our API endpoints are versioned. So we have three versions. We have internal. So internal sounds like it should only be used for internal things, but in our case, internal is anything that's still subject to change. So uh, we have a big chunk of our API endpoints. They're listed in internal, and we're in the process of uh, of moving those over to either V1 or uh, V2. So what we do whenever uh, we release something to V1, if our core product comes with uh, with new functionality that cannot be covered uh, without making uh, breaking changes to uh, to a V1 endpoint, it gets uh, upgraded. The V1 endpoint will always exist, uh, but the V2 endpoint can then uh, access the new uh, the new functionality. And of course, we also use uh, GraphQL. Uh, but in this session, I'll be focused on what we've done uh, with our uh, with our guest API, as most of our uh, as most of our products are built on top of that, or most of our integrations are built on top of our guest API. So, with that out of the way, what kind of uh, what kind of uh, people are we dealing with? So, we have a uh, we have a diverse range of people that are using uh, our API and our product. So on the left, we have the end users. They're very happy to be behind the wheel, but they don't really have any idea what APIs are and how to how to actually use them. In the middle, we have the developers. Uh, they're very happy to directly consume APIs. They're, they're very comfortable with that. And on the right, uh, we have another Quaka, and the Quaka symbolizes uh, management they're very happy if they see fancy buttons they're happy to uh, happy with that but they also have no idea what an uh, what an api is and that is uh, that takes us to the next slide so our downstream dependencies and how these map to uh, to the different uh, the different personas that i just mentioned so we of course have an API playground that's just uh, part of our product uh, uh, of our product release, so I don't have to do anything for that. You can use the, the browser and the desktop tools. So Chrome Developer Mode is a great way to to discover what kind of API calls are being fired if you're using uh, if you're using the GUI. Postman, of course, is a is a great tool. But then we've also uh, taken it uh, a step further. So we built out a number of SDKs. For those of you who are not familiar with the logos, we have PowerShell, Python, and Golang. And on top of that, uh, we have our automation tools. So our, the automation tools, for example, our Ansible, uh, our Ansible plugin uh, uses the Python SDK. Our Terraform provider uses our Golang SDK. So it's Built on top of each other, and they all rely on our uh, uh, on our API uh, endpoints as well. 
And then we have a number of plugins as well. So if we're looking at uh, if we're looking at developers from the uh, from the previous slides, so developers they would either be using uh, one of our SDKs because of the simplicity that uh, uh, and the abstraction it provides. So if an endpoint moves, uh, their code doesn't have to be updated because we update our SDKs. So if there's any changes to uh, to endpoints in the back. Uh, our SDKs provide that level of uh, uh, abstraction. So for for the end users, uh, they might want to want to set up uh, self service. So then our service now plugins would be used. Cool. So then we get to uh, to our challenge. So what is our our major challenge here? So. I already touched on it uh, that we we have different uh, differently versioned uh, uh, API endpoints. They can either be in internal or in V1 or in V2. And whenever there's a version uh, a version uh, change, what we what we used to do was uh, either read to the change log and uh, use that as a guideline to to update our uh, our existing tooling. Make sure our SDKs are up to date before uh, before a new product release, or uh, the reactive approach would be just leave it as is and just wait for issues on GitHub to pile up or people to say why is this not working, which obviously is not uh, <laughs> not a very proactive uh, not not a very proactive approach. So uh, reading the change logs, it, it's a lot of work. I mean, I I. Don't prefer reading change logs. That's also why I started looking at doing it in a uh, in a different way, uh, because we have different product uh, different product versions. Um, we also want to ensure that there's compatibility for at least the uh, last uh, last couple of uh, versions for uh, for our SDKs. So you don't have you can still update and use the new functionality while still being able to. Uh, communicate to older product versions. Um, we also have to manage all the downstream languages. So what I mean with that is, uh, so we, we we have our Python, we have our uh, PowerShell, we have our Golang. Uh, they're all reliant on those endpoints. So how are we going to how are we going to detect which uh, which changes are breaking? Because not not every change is breaking. Because if you update the doc documentation or uh, or a status code, a status code might be breaking, but updating the documentation won't be a breaking change. So uh, that was part of our challenge. And then also we have a new functionality. So whenever new functionality is introduced, it's not necessarily a breaking change, but you still want to work that into uh, into your product and make sure that that's available in, uh, in the SDKs. So, that's a challenge. So, what about a goal? What uh, what were we trying to achieve when we uh, when we uh, started out with automating uh, automating our uh, our version detection? So, our goal was uh, to be able to automate uh, automate our reporting uh, on the version uh, on the version differences. So, um, one of the things I started uh, started doing was. First, look at what is available, and if we if if we go to Swagger and we look at all the open source tools that are available, there's a lot of tools available. But what I found was uh, it's very easy to generate a report on version differences, but then you end up uh, with a lot of uh, a lot of noise as well because there's small changes. There might be a new optional parameter that's introduced to your endpoint. You don't really care about. I mean, it would be nice to implement it, but initially you want to see what is going to break. What do I need to? What do I need to fix right now? And the other part, because we have the structure of internal, uh, internal uh, V1, V2, endpoints can also uh, can also move around. So when an endpoint moves, then obviously we want to update our code to be able to detect that. But also. When we're writing that code, we want to make sure that our moved endpoints are not uh, uh, our older versions are also still able to connect to the endpoints before that. So we have version detection in there as well to ensure that that's there. 
And then also the non-breaking changes, so or the less important changes. So if there's a change in the in the status or in the in the body, either uh, the body that's returned or the body for the post and patch request, or in the parameters, we want to be aware of that and we want to see what we uh, can do with that. Uh, the last one uh, report on uh, on SDK changes. So. This was uh, uh, th th this was my my personal wish and the reason I uh, I started working on uh, on this is what I wanted was whenever there's a new version I want to be able to uh, to run a comparison and see the things that I I need to fix right now and uh, in some cases because. I inherit uh, I, I inherit projects as well. Some projects has not have not been updated for a couple of months, so it might be that I don't want to do a version comparison between the last version and the previous version, but it might have to go back a couple of steps. So I wanted to be able to incorporate that kind of reporting as well. So if I want X number of versions back, I want to be able to see okay, this was working there, this is not working there, this is all the changes, this is breaking and have that kind of reporting available. So what we've, uh, what we've built out is uh, the following. So the first thing I did was uh, I put together, uh, I put a together a comparison framework. So what this framework does is uh, it takes, the, it takes the, the swagger definitions or it can take the JSON, uh, the JSON format as well. Uh, it, it takes two versions. Um, we can define whichever version we want it. Uh, we want it to take. So in this case, uh, the, the latest version and the previous version, and it generates a report with um, with all the breaking changes, with everything that uh, everything that's uh, actionable right now. Once it pulls that, uh, once it pulls that in, what it does is. Uh, it goes into uh, it goes into our SDKs um, because uh, we write our own SDKs, so we know exactly how that uh, how that code is structured. Uh, we we can use those breaking changes and then verify if any of those breaking changes are going to impact anything that our uh, that our SDK is doing. So, in case of, uh, for example, our PowerShell uh, SDK, uh, whenever an endpoint moves. Uh, all we have to do is we have to update uh, we have to update a line that um, and, uh, uh, in which we can say okay this is the uh, um, this is the new endpoint this is what you need to look at uh, here's the here's the updated body or here's the updated parameters and then whenever uh, whenever our end user uses our SDK they can just uh, they they can just continue working as as if nothing changed. So that's also what we want. Uh, and by doing this analysis, what we can do is we can proactively start working on uh, on our breaking changes. So uh, we've got it to the point where we can take uh, we can take the output uh, from the comparison framework. We can then map that to the functionality that's in our SDKs because. Obviously, not everything that's in the uh, in the API is directly supported by the SDK because uh, if you end up doing that, then uh, you end up with a gigantic uh, gigantic project. So, uh, by doing the downstream analysis, by seeing okay, we uh, we have these breaking changes. Uh, they're on line X or function X or We'll have to update these files, and based on that, uh, we can have this framework uh, generate a report. So the report it's structured. So I I created a markdown, but obviously can convert it to uh, to whatever is required. And then, if I want to, I could even use it to automatically uh, create the is issues on GitHub. So we know what to work on and what uh, what to pick up. And uh, as you're probably aware, GitHub has a pretty neat uh, API itself, so we can just do a couple of API calls, uh, log all the issues, and 
make sure they're knocked out of uh, knocked out of the park before uh, uh, before a new release. So uh, the lessons learned. Well, I already knew this, but reading change logs uh, is not a lot of fun. It's time consuming and. Uh, the problem with uh, change logs is that it's uh, the problem with change logs is that they're always incremental. So if you want to go five versions back and you want to see what changed, then you have to read five change logs and go over the, all the incremental changes and add it together in your mind to figure out what what has changed and. Reading a change log is already not fun, but reading five change logs is a lot less fun. And then trying to determine what changed and what moved where, uh, it's not, uh, not not the most easy. So change logs are not fun, but automation is fun. So if you can look at a version, five versions back and compare it to the current and then see everything that changed there, we can, we can dive into old code or you can take a look at old scripts or old programs that are written with uh, an old API in mind. And then we can just determine, OK, well, if these calls are going to be made, then we can make the changes here, here, and here, and then we're good to go again. Uh, automation is fun, but there's always going to be edge cases. So sometimes uh, a current endpoint hasn't changed, and also the uh, it hasn't changed, it hasn't moved, it's still exactly the same. But it might be that uh, new functionality is introduced. The old endpoint still exists, but uh, the new functionality isn't there. So this is where uh, where we get to the point uh, where automation is no longer, uh, <laughs> no longer uh, viable here, because you need to understand the functionality, you need to understand the product to understand how to, uh, how to integrate that. Uh, so those are the edge cases that uh, we can't work with. And then the neat thing is once you've automated everything and uh, you have it, um, uh, you have it automated, you can, you can look at your, uh, you can look at your API changes over, over multiple versions, over different languages, different SDKs, different integrations. You can also integrate it into your processes. So you can, uh, you can create a CI pipeline. So the moment you jump, you drop the new uh, the new uh, open API spec in there, it does a comparison against all versions. You have all reports ready and waiting, and you don't have to uh, you don't have to manually go to uh, to the change logs anymore. So that is uh, what we've uh, what we've put together, and with that, I was asked to leave. Uh, five to ten minutes for questions. So I'd like to uh, let's see. I'd like to open it up. Uh, if for some reason I won't get to your questions today, uh, I always tell people you can uh, you can reach out to me. Uh, probably the easiest way to reach out to me is uh, on Twitter. Um, feel free to to reach out, and I'd like to open it up to everyone else now to uh, to ask your questions if anyone is still awake. I am awake. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. <You're> right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm maybe I'm the only one. I still I still struggle that you can see who is on the other side, right? <laughs> so I was struggling uh, with it uh, before you. Uh, yeah. But before maybe some uh, other questions come, uh, I wonder um, if you run into some um, unexpected scenarios. Um, and how did you deal with uh, this? Yeah, so one of the one of the unexpected scenarios. Um, so <laughs> the, the whole goal was to to make it more proactive and not uh, not not too reactive. And what one of the issues I ran into where um, uh, where an existing endpoint was still there, it was still functional. But it didn't behave exactly as expected because in the new version it had migrated to a new one, and that was actually a case where I just had to read the change log to figure out ah that's what happened. 
Uh, but yeah, before I got the change log, someone was already shouting, hey, why is this not working? So <laughs> those, um, those things are a little bit a little bit harder to uh, harder to catch. And another uh, another example is where uh, we used to have endpoints that were uh, going quite deep. So it was slash this, slash that. And later on, they were renamed to something more simple. But that's all. It was also a bit hard to do a direct ma mapping to that uh, without knowing that that happened. Um, so I wonder uh, if we have more questions or not. Maybe not. Maybe uh, is it possible that maybe uh, you share your Twitter account in the chat if people uh, if people want to um, want to connect with you. If yep, this is the best way uh, to connect with you. Um, as I mentioned before, that all presentations will be available uh, one week after uh, after the conference, and it will be available at api days dot co um, slash watch now. And is the chat also going to be part of the recordings? Uh, this is a actually a good uh, question uh, i don't know the answer but i will ask about it oh, okay well <laughs> okay yeah uh, so um i wonder um because we have a few minutes left and there is uh, another presentation that is uh, that is uh, block note after if there is no questions so you, it's your last chance to ask uh, any questions um, if there is no questions, maybe we'll just um, finish, uh, finish uh, before um, the time, and we will. Everyone will have a moment to stretch and maybe have a snack before the last presentation uh, at the main uh, stage. Um, and afterwards, there's also a networking uh, event after the last presentation, right? What can yes. people expect there? Are, yes. Are, are you are you joining? Of course, I am. But but I didn't meet you yesterday. So uh, okay. No, no, no. Yet yesterday, I uh, I uh, I unfortunately had to uh, work. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there are people. Look, there are two people. <laughs> Thank you guys that you said something because uh, we were considering that maybe we are here by ourselves. <laughs> so it's good <laughs> to see that someone else uh, is with us. So, yes, uh, so it's great comment. After uh, the event, there will be a um, networking party, virtual networking party. But the good thing about it is that. Um, it's called uh, Spatial Chat, so it's API Days uh, dot Spatial dot Chat. And how does it look like that you have uh, your face visible? So it's more interactive, and you are able to. Um, it simulates a normal event that you networking event that you walk from one person to another, and if you if you're circles are close to each other so you can hear each other so that means that people can uh, can stand in groups and uh, listen to each other and i'm sure that there will be dj <laughs> as it was yesterday so it was pretty interesting i didn't expect that uh, but api days team is doing incredible job to make us entertained in this virtual uh, environment. So, when are you coming back to um, to Australia next time? Well, it was originally my plan uh, was to actually attend the API days. So se September was the plan, and currently, well, <laughs> whenever oh. it's possible. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how it is um, in Amsterdam, but we can't go anywhere. So mm. this is. Yeah. Yeah, I think the advantage in Europe is that everything is uh, is a bit closer. So it's what would be driving to another city for you would be driving to five countries for us. So <laughs> that's so true. Uh, but for example, in Poland, I uh, speak to my friends, and they easily um, like 
go for in other countries for holidays. I'm like, seriously? And here uh, we have some limitations, but no complaints because I'm in Sydney and we know that Melbourne people are still in lockdown. So it's always good to appreciate what we really have. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, uh, so it was a real pleasure to uh, to meet you and uh, see you next year. Let's count on it uh, in Australia at live conference. And yeah, please, um, if you and please, and you, you have to uh, visit Rottnest Island to see oh, yeah, that's, us, right? That's, that's, oh, I know what I wanted to. Okay, yeah. one more question. Yeah. How did you choose uh, animals for your presentation? Why managers are quokas? <laughs> oh, I just needed an excuse to put a quokka in there. <laughs> and, yeah, so and, and the reason I put the dogs in there is because I like dogs. So. <laughs> uh, wait, what was the third one? It was dog, um, quokas? It was and two was dogs. Develop uh, okay, yeah. so developers and yeah, yeah, yeah okay. They were <laughs> one smart dog and one clueless dog. Okay, no, I don't know how good dogs because there's okay. no bad dogs. That's true. I'm a cat uh, person, but dogs are cute <laughs> when they're pu puppies mostly. <laughs> okay, um, so this is, I think that um, we had this. You, you could easily present longer, uh, but on the other hand, we already have beginning of our networking party when <laughs> when we can uh, chat about other things than um, than technology. Um, so thank you once again. Uh, I don't remember how was it um, goodbye in Dutch. Tell me that. Uh, well, the easiest one is doei. 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 <laughs> okay, do we? Do we? I like that. In Poland, uh, in Polish, it's test. So you have to repeat that. Yes. Test. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> you nailed it. <laughs> okay, do we? And see you later at the networking party. Thank you. Bye bye. Pleasure to have you. Bye.